So uh, a lot of y'all know I taught school uh, when I first graduated from college, taught fifth grade. I don't know if it's that, maybe being a preacher hasn't helped, but I have this recurring dream. And in, well, I have several recurring dreams, but this one it seems to be the teaching side of my brain. I have a recurring dream where something's going on in the classroom, usually people are loud, and I, you know, I'm telling them to be quiet, no one's paying any attention to me, and I just keep, like, yelling louder, louder and louder, yelling, yelling, and everyone ignores me. So, like, maybe that's one of my deepest, darkest fears. Oh, God, I, thank you, Mike. Yeah, that's right. Oh, man. Okay, let's get into Ezekiel. And we're going to try to cover parts of three chapters today. We'll see how we do with that. Uh, we are closing in on the, the, the end of the book of Ezekiel. And we're talking about this temple thing. And we really are shifting, as we'll see more today, to, uh, to uh, not so much talk about the structure of the temple, but kind of the goings on, what's happening in the temple, and then even in the larger society and the land uh, around the temple, as we'll see. So there's two things we want to focus on. And, uh, you know, we'll, these will be our stopping points in class to stop and discuss. But we're going to see an emphasis on, on justice and on fairness. So we want to talk about why that emphasis is being made. And then an emphasis on, uh, on rituals and the obser- regular observances uh, in this society that Ezekiel is envisioning. Again, this is the uh, kind of the closing section of the book of Ezekiel. And uh, you, we kind of broaden out and say, oh, this is the, the vision of Ezekiel's temple. But as we'll see, as we are seeing, uh, this is a vision of a, a, not just a new temple, but a new society uh, and a new land as it is divided. Um, so let's just kind of review a little bit of where we've been. We've used this pattern because we connected it back to God's work in creation in Genesis 1. But in Ezekiel 40 to 42, we, we saw the ordering of the space. Okay? We saw the lines, for instance, that are drawn uh, to mark off the various sections and boundaries of the temple complex. We talked about the walls and the gates. It was explicitly said, actually, in chapter 42, that uh, the walls were to keep out what is profane or unholy and keep in what is holy. But there are these lines that are drawn. And uh, once the lines are drawn and the boundaries are put in place, then some of these spaces are designated as uh, having a particular purpose or a particular significance. And so there is inside the sanctuary of the temple, as there was with previous temples, a most holy place, sanctuary and a most holy place. And then around the temple complex, there are various rooms and chambers. Okay? But again, this is just the space itself. We're really, we're, we didn't see anything happening in these places. They were just the places. Right? Similar to, again, the first three days of creation when God separated light and dark, and water above, water below, and land uh, and sea. But after that, then, in the next two chapters of Ezekiel, God fills that space. Again, similar to the way that on days four, five, and six, he filled those spaces with sun, moon, and stars, birds and fish, and beast and man. And so in Ezekiel's temple, once the space is ordered, then uh, the, the first and foremost thing to fill the space is God himself. And so there's this uh, a picture in 43 of God coming as this cloud, the same glory that he saw that Ezekiel saw back in chapter 1 and in chapters 8 through 11. It represents the throne of God and it comes and it fills the temple. Okay? But we also saw other things in the temple, things and people. We saw the altar in chapter 43 standing in the center of the temple complex. And then in chapter 44, we've been looking at various people and their activities within the temple. The prince, uh, who we'll talk more about the Levites and the priests and the various work that they are engaged in. Well, we tried to say on Wednesday, we tried to lay out this kind of, uh, this, this rule, this uh, formula for interpretation, okay? Because again, this, uh, this vision um, isn't, and you know, it, it uh, let's just get my thoughts together here. There are a number of people that think that this vision is a, a picture that's going to translate to a, a literal fulfillment of some sort in the future. Okay, uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about that, except that there are a lot of people that think that at some point, um, you know, the walls and the gates and the complex that Ezekiel describes, boom, going to be built as is. Okay, um, 
the sacrifices and the rituals and everything that Ezekiel describes, at some point in the future, boom, that's going to happen. We're going to, you know, someone's going to participate in that, and those activities are going to be carried out. Right? Um, we have talked over and over again about the fact that, that that's just not, I think, what the point is. Uh, and the text even provides us with quite a bit of evidence to suggest that this was not a building, inst- an instruction for a building to actually be built. These were not instructions for uh, activities that would really be carried out in the way that they're described. Instead, there's kind of a two-part interpretation that the various symbols point to uh, some sort of meaning, a principle that is at work in this vision. It's a vision. It's kind of an imaginary picture of uh, things as they should be, right? Um, but it's a vision, And so it uses symbols. Those symbols have meaning. There's a principle behind it. And our task then is to identify what the principle is and then identify how that's fulfilled in uh, what is, I think, being anticipated, which is the kingdom of Christ now and uh, later, now in in, in the future. Okay. Um, So we did examples of this before. We won't belabor the point. But walls, right, uh, carry with it this idea of, of protection, of boundaries, again, dividing holy from profane, and we know that in Christ's kingdom, there are boundaries, right, between out, who's on the outside, what's on the outside, what's on the inside, uh, come out from among them and be separate, right? You go on and on with the, with the applications of that principle uh, that we drew from the walls, right? Uh, or the altar, standing in the center, okay? Uh, the altar is a symbol of atonement, and we know that in Christ's kingdom, at the center of our relationship with God, the dwelling that we have with God is cross and the atonement that was made at the cross uh, to even make this uh, fellowship, this dwelling with God um, as his people, as his temple even possible. Okay, So I want to kind of go back to some of what we talked about in chapter 44. Uh, Real quickly, I I wanted to return to this idea that in chapter 44, there's this odd element in which there is a division of labor. That the, was the title for Wednesday's lesson, a division of labor, that uh, the Levites were, were given things to do, um, but they, they weren't to do everything. That they were uh, co- supposed to serve in the temple, even you know, offer sacrifices, but they were not to come near and serve in the most holy things. Instead, it was the sons of Zadok who uh, would serve, um, before God and before the holy things as priests. There's this, this division here. And we kind of asked the question and began discussing on Wednesday, well, what's the point here? What do we learn from seeing that, you know, the priests or the Levites did one thing, the sons of Zadok did another thing, there was a, a division there, there was a separation. Um, and uh, I was already starting to feel like some of the things that, that I had kind of brought up, some of the things I was saying, not that they were wrong, but that maybe we were missing really where the emphasis should be. We were talking some about uh, the various rewards, right? Like a, the parable of the talents, different people rewarded in different ways. I was already starting to feel like, ah, maybe we should revisit that and, and, uh, and, and talk about that some more. And then I got a very long and very rude, uh, as you can imagine, text message from Jordan Holland. Um, he said, I was listening to class. And he said, you totally missed it. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm surprised Jordan's even here this morning because I thought he was going to be gone. He was going to just, I can't even come back for a few weeks. Um, Jordan was very upset. But he, he pointed some things that were helpful to me in thinking through this, that, that really I think the, the main point of what we would take from a passage like Ezekiel 44 is not so much the various rewards that will be, you know, doled out in, uh, in the kingdom of Christ, but a division of labor or of responsibility in the kingdom. So I'll ask you. uh, And part of what I I feel like we missed on Sunday was that we were too, or on Wednesday, was too quickly jumping to, you know, the heavenly reward. Okay, so I thought, well, let's backtrack a little bit. Even within the kingdom as it is now, as it's constructed now, can you think of of examples in Jesus' kingdom where there is a division of these people do this, these people do this, and there's, a, in some cases, some pretty hard lines between that. Yeah, uh, there, there's a passage. Remember where it is, Albert? <laughs> some are given by God to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, or pastor teachers, depending on the translation there. Okay. What else? Other examples of that? Okay, parts of the body is one. Remember a passage, Robert? 1 Corinthians 12, for instance, 
Uh, I think I heard somebody say, elders and deacons, men and women, okay? So you see, you're like, oh, okay, now I'm maybe starting to see that, that uh, this is a thing, right? There are members of the body in 1 Corinthians 12, and, and Paul's pretty particular to say, hey, you know, you're an eye, you be an eye, and, you know, let the foot be the foot, uh, for instance, okay? Another version of that is what Albert mentioned, that everyone has different gifts, there are different gifts given to the church, uh, elders and deacons. I put Acts 6 on here because Acts 6 is kind of like proto-elders and proto-deacons. Those n- terms are not used, but I think we see a picture of, of what is intended in the church. And the apostles in Acts 6, if you remember, there's this need uh, for the Grecian widows to uh, you know, be, be fed, to be represented more fully. And the apostles say, actually, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we, have, we have other things to do. We have, you know, like praying and ministering the word. And so we need other people to to do that so there's a role carved out here which i think is a picture of the deacon's role uh that we see later in the new testament so elders and deacons men and women we think of the passages that talk about what men are to do what women are to do there are lines between those okay and then even a parable like the parable of the talents could actually work both ways for now and to come i mean there's an element of the parable of the talents to say well you know we are each given various you know abilities right or levels of uh uh, of resource, you know, whatever it is. So there's a difference there. And then even in the reward that's doled out, um, and uh, this is actually what Jordan was pointing out, that the, uh, the giving of cities in the, in the parable of the talents in, in the Luke version of this, Jordan said, I'm not sure that's a reward. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, congratulations, you were a faithful servant. Now, Brian, you have to manage 10 cities uh, in the age to come. It's like, no, I thought I was going to kick my feet up. And, you know, so maybe it's an entrusting of, more, of responsibility more than it is a reward that's that's given out okay even this passage like in john 21 where uh, jesus has told peter that he's gonna you know be killed uh bound and killed for the sake of christ and then he kind of turns around and says what about that guy over there you know john's standing over there and uh, as it turns out john actually seems to live the rest of his you know natural life and peter's like well what about him and uh jesus basically tells him sweep your side of the street okay don't worry about him you you know follow me okay so in, in, in lots of different ways, we see this principle of labor in the kingdom that is divided up. Um, and I find this helpful because I feel like there is a tendency when we see these lines drawn in the New Testament to, uh, you know, to you know, push back against them or to be graded by that. But in some ways, the, the, the beauty of this vision in Ezekiel 40 to 48 is to see there, there's beauty in this. Uh, there's beauty in God's design to order things as they should be ordered, not to mention the fact that, you know, okay, God's uh, wisdom and knowledge is so far beyond ours uh, that we should just trust in the way that he has ordered things. But creation from the beginning uh, was ordered and structured, and we see that same sort of order and structure um, in Ezekiel's temple, which is a picture of uh, uh, the kingdom of Christ now and in the age to come. Okay, anything else you want to say about that? Yeah, Mike. Everyone in the kingdom, something they can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because even if, even on the elders and deacons side, even if they're qualified, quote unquote, uh, you know, their mental makeup might not be good for that. So they could, you know, do other services instead of just that the women having things to do, it gave everybody something to do, uh, which pulls together a family more when each person is doing something different and pulling their own weight. Thank you, Mike. Albert, over here. What comes to me is Zadok and the Levites. You think of the Levites messed up and and defiled and, and took their responsibilities in error, and now in this picture... It's it's the new it's it's the remnant that has been given a new chance. When I think uh, if the if I my only qualification or to be eligible to be in there is that I had to do good during difficult times. But the Levites, these folks, is a stretch possibly or assumption, repentant and 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 renewed. So in in this kingdom, those who had failed. You see them still in there, still getting a part to be able to be a, which is the priority, to be a servant, to still serve God. Whether I'm 
emptying trash cans or I'm leading, you know, to be able to serve for the, the greater good is is a great reward and a feeling. So I just, but the Levites and the Zadoks, the Levites fell away. They, they did err, but yet there is a means for them through a change of heart, through repentance, that they still get to partake in, in something. So trying to work that out, but hopefully yeah. you can just see that if heaven is for those that are only do right the whole time, then I'm not going to be there. But if I can have the opportunity to repent and change, heaven is still open and available for me. Oh, thank you, Albert. And uh, by the way, I'll, I don't think we've mentioned this, uh, but um, we should point out that between the, the sons of Zadok and the Levites, nobody's innocent here. Okay, uh, I don't know if you th- had that thought as we're reading through. It's like, the sons of Zadok are described as if they, you know, were righteous and holy the whole way through. You know, even as, the, no, no, we remember the real story of Ezekiel, okay? Everybody had missed it, okay? So maybe there's a sense of relative faithfulness relative to the rest of the crew. Um, but still, the whole nation had fallen into unfaithfulness and to sin. And that gets us back from Albert's point uh, to what Mike said on Wednesday, which is that, you know, the, 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 is the, People reading this should their first thought should be, oh man, we're, we we don't even deserve to have this in the first place. So if I get to participate in this, I, I don't even deserve to be here at all. So if I have any part part to play, then I'm thankful uh, for God's grace in that regard. Okay, um, and then we could do the same thing. We kind of rush through this, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it here. But a si- similar sort of thing in chapter 44, verse 17 and following, where there's all these rules for. The priests, the sons of Zadok, what they wear, how they cut their hair, um, you know, the drinking of wine, marriage, their public role. And again, the, the, the task here would be, we kind of did a tiny, tiny bit of this on Wednesday, would be to say, okay, what's the, what's the point in describing priests um, that have all these kind of regulations and restrictions? And, and I think probably this is the direction we should go. Remember that their role, and this was true of the priests in, this, in the Law of Moses as well, but here in Ezekiel 44, their role is to judge between the people, to teach the people, okay, to uh, uh, um, bring the people closer to God and to make sure they keep the Sabbaths, okay? So you start with that and you realize that our role as priests is uh, much the same, that we take the word of God to people, we teach people, uh, we, we um, encourage people to keep the commandments, right, all that kind of stuff uh, that we see where that bridge between people and God, that role that, or that purpose then helps to make sense of, well, in order to do that, I've got I got to live a holy life, okay? Uh, I can't live a life that's defiled and contaminated by all the same sins of the world and then expect to, to do my job as a priest and bring people to God, right? Holiness is required for those who build bridges between uh, a sinful people and a holy God, okay? And so you can draw those sorts of principles um, from the instructions given to the priests here in Ezekiel 44, as weird as it is and difficult as it is to read, Okay? Well, where we go next, as I said, is really beyond the temple to thinking about God's ordering of uh, the land of Israel and uh, uh, the society of, of Israel. And I will admit to you, this is a little bit strange the way this works because we jump around a decent amount. We kind of introduce some things uh, here that get left and then come back to later on towards the end of the book. Um, and then there's going to be some things that pop up. You said, well, I thought we had already talked about that. And it shows back up. Um, and so, uh, so we'll try to just hit the highlights here this morning in chapters 45 and 46. Um, there are some handouts there. There's a handout that actually don't have it, but it's a map and on one side and a diagram on the other side. If you don't have that, raise your hand and, uh, maybe you can get Angel. Thanks for standing up. Why don't you grab those handouts and, uh, um, get those passed out to everybody. But uh, again, it's a map of Israel on one side that's divided up between the tribes, and then on the other side, it's a, a diagram of the sacred region, uh, the holy region, um, and this will be useful today and, and on Wednesday as well, um, so we can make more copies if, if you need one, okay? But uh, the land is started to be divided up, and so at the end of chapter 44, we will read this paragraph here, 44 verse 28 He's been talking about the priest, and so he's kind of still talking about the priest, but transitions to their uh, portion of the land um, when the land's divided up. And so Ezekiel 44, verse 28, 
this will be their inheritance. Remember, the, the language in the Old Testament is that the land is the inheritance. Okay, and so people are given land as an inheritance. But this will be the inheritance of the priest, 44, 28. I am their inheritance, and you shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. They shall eat the grain offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering, and every devoted thing in Israel shall be theirs. And the first of all, the first fruits of, the, of all kinds, every offering of all kinds from your offspring, off, offerings shall belong to the priest. You shall also give the priest the first of the dough, that the blessing may rest on your house. The priest shall not eat anything, whether bird or beast, that has died of itself or torn by animals. Okay? Um, so, as the land is about to be divided up, the priests don't actually get any of the land for themselves. This was actually the case uh, for the most part, in the Law of Moses as well, gave you a passage there, um, that uh, the tribes were all given their portion of the land, but if you look back at your map, right, in, in the, your Bible that divides it, the, you know, you don't see Levi on there, okay? And the reason is because they weren't given a portion of the land. Instead, some of the same language is used about God is their inheritance. They don't re- serve the land or, or receive the land. Um, also, in the law of Moses, kind of instead of that, the Levites lived in cities spread throughout the other tribes of, of, of Israel, okay? And it's very symmetrical. It's like three on one side of the Jordan, three on the other side of the Jordan, north, south, and in between. And uh, they were to be among the people. So they lived in these cities among the people. Um, so that's repeated here. An idea is repeated there. And because they don't have land, that means they're not working the land to provide for themselves. Instead, they are provided for by the offerings and the tithes of the people. That was also the case in the Law of Moses, and that's repeated here. And that transitions us then to chapter 45, verse 1 to 8, in which God starts breaking down how the land will be divided. And the first thing that's, uh, and really the only thing here that's explained, is uh, what we might call the sacred district, or the holy district, okay? Um, and you see, well, we'll go back and forth here. This is um, the two charts that you have, okay? So starting with this one, this right here, this map and div- and that's divided up between the tribes, is, will, it will be described in chapter 48. That's not here in 45. Uh, the division for these tribes will be given to us in chapter 48. But what we are given here in 45 is this description of the sacred portion and uh, zoom in on that, it looks like the other side of your handout, okay? So in chapter 45, verse 1 to 8, we are told that there's going to be a district blocked off for the temple itself, and this is where the priests are going to live. And then on one side of that, it seems, is going to be for the Levites. Remember, they're not the priests, but they need to be close still to serve in the things of the temple, Okay. Um, and then there's another side, uh, people have these arranged differently, but there's another uh, side in which there's a city, and there's land to be used for the, by the people of Israel themselves. And then on either side of this, because remember if you go back here, this district stretches from the sea to the river. Uh, on either side of this is the land that is reserved, it says, for the prince. That's the Hebrew word for prince. I maybe should have put that on there, but you can jot that on your list here. Um, prince receives a portion, really the prince and his family receive a portion on either side of the holy district, and that comprises this entire portion here, uh, right in the middle of the land of Israel, okay? So this is what's described in 45, 1 to 8. Any questions? Okay, Um, let's talk about uh, what is said next, okay? So, uh, the holy district was described, and then the portions given to the prince and his family in verses 7 and 8. But notice verse 8. Um, it says, it is to be his, again, we're talking about the prince here. It is to be his property in Israel. And my princes shall no more oppress the people, but they shall let the house of Israel have the land according to their tribes. And then we keep reading, verse 9. Thus says the Lord God, enough, O princes of Israel, put away violence and oppression, execute justice and righteousness, cease your evictions of my people, declares the Lord God. Okay. So in dividing up the land, and the land that is specifically that is given to the princes, and uh, we're saying that the princes here refers to rulers. Um, we said this on Wednesday, I don't think the prince here is a picture of Christ. For one, you see that princes is used plural here, for one. 
princes. So these are the rulers, I think, among God's people. And they are given land. And when God gives them their land, he says, stop stealing land from other people, from the, from the people. Okay? And that's the picture of this new society, that there will no longer be oppression and uh, eviction of the people from their land. Um, it's on there, so you could probably uh, have cheated already. Okay? Um, but uh, do you remember a story about a king stealing land from somebody? Ahab, and who did he steal the land from, right? Yeah, Nadab, Nabal, Naboth. That's it, Naboth. Okay, yeah. Uh, Naboth's vineyard. That's the story in 1 Kings 21. And that's a fairly uh, representative picture. In fact, I put on your handout the reference to Ezekiel 34. That was, that was the, most of the rebuke of Ezekiel 34 about the shepherds of Israel. You're devouring... Instead of feeding, you're devouring the people you're supposed to be ruling over. This was, this was a very common thing. And for that reason, the emphasis on justice and righteousness uh, was huge in the prophets. And so here, it says in Ezekiel 45, verse 9, that they will, the princes now in this newly ordered society among God's people, they will execute justice and righteousness and allow the people to live on their land. Okay? Um, he comes back to this in chapter 46 for a few verses, so that reference is there. Um, and then you have a few references to other places. Amos 5, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is a picture of, uh, of the Messianic kingdom, okay? that there would be justice and righteousness, particularly among those who rule over the people. Okay? And I think the next section fits into this as well. Okay? Uh, the next section, 10 to 12, we won't read. And it's a very odd kind of description of what the weights and the measurements will be in this new kingdom, okay? Um, I heard this, and then I Googled it. You know, there's, I, I wish I could remember, there's something called the International Bureau for Weights and Measures. Did you know that? I'm like, man, this is, this is what's wrong with our world, you know? Uh, but maybe not. I mean, who, who decides, right, like what, what a gallon is when you go buy a gallon? Well, apparently, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures decides it, Okay. Uh, because that's, that's a way of setting a boundary around fairness and, uh, and justice, okay? Especially in a society like an ancient society where there's trade and things are weighed and we don't have exact measurements or an international bureau, right? Um, there's a great passage in Amos 8 where it, te- it, it rebukes these people that can't wait for church to be over so they can run out and trade is one, one interesting thing about that. But also says they make the... Uh, if I get, get, it, get it right here. Um, they make the ephah, which is the weight or the, or the measure, they make the ephah small and the shekel great. Okay? Um, meaning, they give you a little bit and they charge a lot. Right? This is like the classic case of this, probably what Amos was referring to, is potato chips. Right? I mean, what has happened through the years? The bags get bigger and more and more filled with air. Okay? And they charge you five bucks for it and then there's like three chips at the bottom. Right, um, and so the pro- the prophets rebuked people for adjusting and twisting weights and measures in order to profit and to take advantage of people. In this new society, there's going to be fairness and there's going to be uh, um, equity because of that. And even the next portion or the next sec- section of the scripture, which is maybe a transition, talks about this relationship that would take place between the prince, the rulers, and the people. That the people would bring in their offerings, a portion of that offering would go to the prince. So they'd pay his salary, uh, so to speak, um, by a small portion of every offering that they brought. Okay? But the prince, when it came to feasts and offerings for these appointed days, the, priest, or the, the prince would be the one to foot the bill for those offerings. And so you have this, this kind of uh, relationship, um, harmonious and fair relationship between the rulers and the people. That's really, I think, the, the, the gist of this section um, and the vision of, of Ezekiel's society. So, all this talk about fairness um, and justice. Now I ask you, and we pause here for, for a minute to talk. Um, why? <laughs> what does this have to do with anything? And uh, how does this uh, translate to the kingdom of Jesus?
Jordan, we'll start with you. Maybe um, I'm thinking about the economic regulations in particular. Um, this equality across the board, like in the new covenant, the kingdom of Jesus, there is balance and equality. Thinking about the parable, I think maybe you mentioned it on, on, on Wednesday night about the laborers and when they came to get the laborers. So it doesn't matter. There's different, to your point, there's different kind of roles and responsibilities, but in the end, in the end game, I guess, my point being, there, there's, things are equitable. Um, we're all God's creation in the new covenant. Thank you, Jordan. And that reminds me of a passage, um, speaking literally of money. Well, actually, I'm not even going to, I'm, I'm going to wait. There's too many good ideas out there. Let's get Brian and then uh, John after Brian. Yeah, I can't, I, I'm not sure I can do a fair justice to answering this thing, but um, I, I'm looking at the fair relationship, if you will. And actually, in our relationship to Christ and God, it's unfair because he provides so much more. But nonetheless, he provides for us all the blessings in this life. And and we, in response, are stewards of that to give back to God, to give back to others. Basically, we serve and love God by serving and loving each other. Uh, what does God say? How can you love me who you do not see if you don't love your brother who you do see? And so I see that uh, God is providing for us, and we, in turn, uh, serve God with that which he's provided. Thank you, Brian. John? I know we've mentioned before, the uh, maybe on Wednesday even, the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first concept, but um, when we think about the apostles who wanted to sit at the right hand and the seat of prominence, prominence that would have been the seat of the prince more or less uh in in a story like this mm. and the concept is that if you want to sit in that seat you will serve greatly and the person who's serving greatly is, is not in a position to take advantage it's not in a position to uh abuse the people in fact it's it's quite the inverse relationship there so almost everything you know not just resetting but it's it's all all meant to help people in a way that's very unlike any earthly kingdom. Thank you, John. Albert? Always have time for... Well, thank you. So I think of the New Testament, I think of the Apostle Paul and the debate of whether he should take wages or not. I think about mm -hmm. Jesus in the temple and how they were saying, oh, no, that's a blemished sheep, use ours, and how they were defrauding the... I don't know, I'm stuck on the word defraud. i got to stop. i got to expand whatever that book is, uh, how in uh, there is going to be government and we are going to be paying taxes and we're going to be having land. So they needed this to be explained to the people currently, but I think for us today also, this is where we vary and where we, we mess up society. And when we, we need to look at this for us currently today, that there is going to be equity and not necessarily we may not see it as fair because I don't think I should pay taxes, but I do understand the need for roads and building and government and all. So it's just obstacles that we throw in front of ourselves and I can just see in the actual first century time as well as for us today, how this is helpful for us. Thank you, Albert. Um, so a few passages I'll, I'll just kind of throw out there. Um, one is in uh, Second Corinthians. Of course, now I can't find it. We just did we just study. Someone just taught Second Corinthians, right? Um, okay, so so in Second Corinthians, in talking about the literal giving of money from Christians who had a lot to Christians that, that were going to be in need of money, um, you remember that Paul was collecting money for the needy Christians in Jerusalem. He says. Um, Verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 8, I do not mean that others should be eased and you be burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your, abund your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. Okay, so what's the fairness? It's like, well, when you have a lot and they have a little, you share. And guess what? It's going to turn around at some point the other direction. He actually quotes from an Old Testament passage to, to back up his point. But uh, that's Paul's vision of, uh, of the kingdom and the fairness in the kingdom. We, our idea of fairness, I think, has probably been warped. And you may, we, went, we may want to argue, well, that's not really fair because that's money that I earned. And so, you know, it's not fair for me to give it away to somebody else. Paul says, no, fairness in the kingdom is 
Those who have a lot share with those who have a little. There's a leveling out of things there. Uh, and that's, that's demonstrated by the early church in the book of Acts. Remember, no one had any need because they had all things in common. And uh, those who had gave and it was shared, distributed to others. Okay? So that's one, I think, you know, picture working out of the principle of equity and fairness described to us in Ezekiel 45 uh, in the kingdom. But I, I think, you know, kind of one more thing to say about that is that uh, in chapter 45, where is the onus, onus place? I think I'm using that word, right? Who, who is charged, first and foremost, with there being fairness um, in this new society? The print, the leaders, right? And so we go back to Ezekiel 34, the shepherds. We have shepherds in the church today. Think about New Testament passages about the shepherds. 1 Peter 5, that talk about don't do it for money. Don't do it to take advantage of people. Don't lord it over people, okay? And that's what John's describing is this totally reversed picture of the kingdom where those who are in charge don't use that for their own power, their own gain, uh, their own you know, benefit. They are, like Jesus, total servants. And so that's kind of, that, that is what, where everything starts. And from there, then you have a, a, um, a kingdom, you have churches that operate with this principle of fairness, using what I have, uh, whatever it might be, um, to, to benefit somebody else. Okay, Mike, last word, and then we're going to move on. Here. that it is the goal to have harmony and peace to keep the rest of this stuff, to keep it on that even keel, and even just down to a individual level, if you have harmony and peace, I mean, I could, I could come to, up to you and say, Daniel, gas is $5 a gallon right now, right? Something like that. So, here, I'll give you this. That's a gallon of gas. Give me five bucks. And, you know, just that sort of sham that goes on amongst brethren when it comes to weight measures, to economic boundaries, whatever, is not going to be living towards the harmony and peace and love that we need to enjoy and put forth in the kingdom itself. Thank you, Mike. So let's keep going here. Uh, I think we have about five minutes, so seven minutes. Um, and uh, maybe a good thing. This, this is... Stuff that we can kind of work through fairly quickly here. The rest of 45 and 46. Okay, so again, how this connects together, I'm not exactly sure, but it's kind of like he was talking about uh, the priests, and that, you know, got him talking about the priests' inheritance in the land, um, which they weren't really going to have any, but that then got him talking about the sacred district and the lines for this holy portion of the land, which got him talking about that some of that sacred district is apportioned to the prince, which got him talking about how the prince is supposed to not, you know, uh, abuse the people. Um, instead, this, you know, so I said this fair and equitable relationship, uh, which got him talking about how in the offerings, some of the offerings would come to the prince and the prince would supply the offerings for the appointed feast, which gets him talking about the appointed feast. So that makes sense that we followed me there? Yeah. That was pretty good. I did that kind of on the, on the fly there. So uh, we're now talking about the feast um, and uh, several feasts that are talked about and again, this is one of those weird things. It's like, why is there all this in detailed description about an imaginary society uh, that, that's going to have all these feasts? Why are we told about all these feasts? But we are. So there are yearly celebrations in this, uh, this new society that Ezekiel envisions. I have uh, them, some of them on your, or the, the three of them on your handout there, okay? Um, that there is kind of a, a new year, first month, first day offering in, in verse 18, there's really nothing exactly like that in the Law of Moses, but this is something that, that is envisioned here. Um, the Passover in verses 21 to 24 and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, first month, 14th day is Passover. 15th day and onward for a week is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That is parallel to the Law of Moses. And then it's not called the Feast of Booths in verse 25, but it's the same time frame, if you look back at Leviticus 23, as the Feast of a boot. So there are these yearly observances that would be recognized with their various offerings. Um, there would also be more frequent days, moving into chapter 46, verse 1 and, uh, and following. Uh, there would be more frequent days. Uh, weekly, the Sabbath would be kept. Um, and also monthly, the Feast of the New Moon would be kept. Again, those are uh, uh, um, regular observances under the Law of Moses. The Sabbath and the, the Feast of the New Moon. 
and those are repeated here. And even daily, uh, there are sacrifices and offerings made in verses 11 to 15. Um, and it describes the role that the prince plays. Again, we saw that before. The prince plays a, a central role in the providing and the offering of these sacrifices. And then uh, skipping over the section that kind of goes back to the prince acting with fairness and equity, the end of chapter 46 describes, um, we go back. I'm not sure where, how this jump happened, but he jumps here at the end of 46 back to rooms and the fact that there will be chambers in the corner of the temple complex in which uh, there potentially be kitchens, it calls it that, but the offerings would be baked and, uh, and boiled. Okay? Um, okay, so we got three minutes here. Why all the talk about yearly observances and monthly observances and weekly observances and daily sacrifices? Uh, why a chapter and a half laying out all these ritual observances? Robert, thank you. I, you got an answer for it. Well, um, maybe. Um, I, I still think that it comes right back to why are we here? We're, we're here to get to heaven. We're here to, to make, uh, to to close that gap that, that Christ allowed us to close uh, to be in that relationship with God. The, to me, uh, you know, the, the Jews had all of these rules and regulations, right, that were given in the Old Testament. Ezekiel's pointing forward, I think, to the, the new way of worshiping God in, in our time uh, af after Christ. And he's simply saying, that, especially at the end there of uh, 45, nothing's changed. There still needs to be that closing of, of the sin. We still need to rectify our relationship with God. We're going to have to continue to worship him in potentially different ways than the Old Testament. And he's trying to prepare them and us by us looking back. Thank you, Robert. Jordan, thoughts on that? I mean, this is, this is the lifestyle of Ezekiel's vision. And so to translate New Covenant, our, our Christian lifestyle permeates everything, all day, every day, uh, not a Sunday thing, not a Wednesday thing, but in all situations. So yeah. equally to me, it's a lifestyle. And you say lifestyle, you say that this is describing a lifestyle of, what would you say? What are they, what are they doing all the time in Ezekiel society? Uh, well, service, yeah, worship, okay. I try to hint at it with the title of the, you know, uh, and the objective. See, Brian's using his noggin here. But no, I love what Jordan says here. It, it, this is a, it's ongoing, okay? Uh, yearly, monthly, weekly, daily, God's people are involved in worship, right? That, that defines, that characterizes their life. To Robert's point, at the heart of all that is still this uh, emphasis on atonement, okay? Without the atonement, then, uh, you know, none of this works, okay? But the atonement is not through the daily sacrifices. The atonement is through the sacrifice of Jesus, and yet we still, we worship, now, how much more so, we worship daily, weekly, monthly, yearly uh, in, in this new kingdom. Continue daily to celebrate our relationship with God, which is basically what all these are also. Uh, so that's the, that's the main thing that it can point towards the new covenant is our celebration in lifestyle, daily, whatever it might be, our relationship in God's kingdom. Thank you, Mike. Come we that love the Lord, right? Let our joys be known as we march to Zion. Um, that's it. We did pretty good. So um, hopefully you can explain why there's so much emphasis on justice and fairness. Part of the explanation is points backward to Israel's history, and then part of the explanation points forward to what God, Jesus' kingdom is like, and then explain the emphasis on ritual observance, worship, in Ezekiel's society. Very cool. We may finish Wednesday, guys, so don't miss that. Ezekiel 47, 48. We're going to do our best to get through that uh, so you can read it before Wednesday. Thank you, guys.